This book is a window into the past, dedicated to the courage and sacrifice of my friends and fellow countrymen. Together, we flew the skies during some of the darkest and most innovative days in history, the Great War and the dawn of aviation. Those years of flying and fighting taught me everything, that every decision matters, that the road to freedom sometimes takes you through hell, and that only by facing our fears do we truly discover what we're made of. My story isn't unique, and I'm no more of a hero than any other pilot who suited up to defend king and country. I wasn't the best, and I wasn't the worst, but I was there flying with the greats over the front lines. In life, there are many defining moments. The first time I laid eyes on an airplane, I was barely 15. It was at the first air show in Toronto back in 1910. Right then and there, I knew I would fly, but I had no idea where it would take me. In late 1915, I saw a newspaper advertisement for the Royal Naval Air Service. They were looking for pilots. This was my chance. I enrolled at the Curtis Flying School in Toronto, which was the only one around at the time. There weren't many spots available, so I was lucky to even get in. Flying was everything I dreamed it would be. You can't imagine the freedom up there. It had been barely a decade since the very first flight, and here we were, a bunch of rowdy young boys with the sky as our playground. It didn't take me long to get my wings. There wasn't much to the requirements back then. Taking off and landing. That was pretty much it. As soon as I could, I joined the Royal Naval Air Service, or RNAS, the Navy's flying arm. At the time, the RNAS was taking more Canadian recruits than the Royal Flying Corps, or RFC, which supported the Army. A few weeks later, I was off to England, and I hoped, off to war. By the time I got to England, it was the summer of 1916. Western Front was a shambles. Hundreds of thousands had died on both sides during the Battle of the Somme, and there was no end in sight. I wasn't thrilled to find myself assigned to a training squadron at East Church. I had my wings and seven and a half hours of flying, for crying out loud. I considered myself as prepared as anyone to fight the war. Of course, that wasn't the case at all. And thank God I wasn't sent over to Europe right away. Probably would have bought it on my very first mission.
Training in England made me see that good flying wasn't enough. You also needed good gunnery. We'd done a little rifle training, but it was nowhere near what we needed to actually survive, or even do any real damage up there. So I set my sights on becoming a sharpshooter. I learned and mastered skills like deflection, which is shooting where the enemy will be, and not where they are when you pull the trigger. After training, we were assigned to our service squadrons. I was furious when I was posted to the bloody home defense at Yarmouth, and not somewhere in Belgium or France. It felt like I was never going to get to the real action. I got over it after meeting a bunch of other Canadians. Made some good friends. John Page and I got on well from day one. He was a great pilot, and a natural with the ladies. He taught me a thing or two in both departments. My first bird was the BE-2C. It was slow and steady. We used to joke that it took years to make a turn. Not the best fighter airplane up there, that's for sure. We discovered soon enough, though, that it was an excellent night fighter, and night missions would end up being an important part of what we did.
Germans had been sending Zeppelins across the English Channel at night, loaded with bombs, to dump on targets all over England. The idea was to terrify civilians so they'd pressure the king and parliament to surrender. That didn't happen. Instead, the public called for more and more attacks on German targets. At the time, the RNAS was in charge of home defense. When word got out that a fleet of enemy Zeppelins was on its way, our mission was simple. Find them and shoot them down. But taking down a Zeppelin is more of a challenge than you think. Sure, they're big and slow, but they were also armed to the teeth and hard to see, even with searchlights scanning the skies. The night of September 2nd was my first taste of an encounter with a Zeppelin. I can still see the smoke trails from the incendiary bullets as I unloaded the drum of my Lewis machine gun into one of the massive beasts. of many times to come, I felt the rush of victory in every cell of my body. But that night in bed, after the celebrating was done, the thrill of the night slipped away. I was left alone with the horrifying reality that I'd just killed half a dozen men or more. Men who, like me, were sons, brothers, friends. I wrestled that night with the whole idea of right and wrong. In the end, 
I guess there's no choice in a war. It's either kill or be killed. The trouble is that if you survive, you have to live with it. I still can't stare into a fire without ending up back there watching that airship and her crew falling from the sky. After a few months of flying in England, I got word that I was finally being shipped out to the continent. In February 1917, I was transferred to Naval 10, a new squadron just formed at St. Paul in France, near Dunkirk. When I arrived, the place was at sixes and sevens. At first, we didn't even have birds to fly, so we spent our days doing odd jobs like building tables in the mess hall. Not exactly my idea of excitement, given a choice between that and the front lines. Although I did like having a place to sit at dinner. Early in March, a few Newport 12s showed up, along with one Sopwith triplane. The Newport was practically obsolete at the time. It was painfully slow, and known to break up in steep dives, so you had to be careful what you did with it. The triplane, on the other hand, was beautiful. Only the most experienced officers could take it up. We were promised that more triplanes were coming, but I definitely wasn't holding my breath, considering we only just got dinner tables. My two partners in crime at the time were William Ollie Smith Oliver and Gerald Nash. We worked hard and we played harder. The boys in your squadron quickly become your family. We were in this thing together. I don't think you can really understand what that's like unless you live it.